All right, Brother Smith's going to preach to us tonight. Amen. John chapter 9, uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I can't say it is my favorite because I believe 2 Timothy chapter 2 holds that place. Uh, but this is a near and dear story to a lot of believers. Uh, one of my favorite chapters, like I said, it is a good time to be a Christian. Uh, I'm glad in the, uh, the way that the winds of this world is blowing that I'm not lost right now. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, the Lord found me. I'm thankful that I know that my name is secure in the book of life. And there's not a better time, by my estimate, to be a, a believer. And uh, I'm excited to see what God's going to do in the coming days. Uh, I know that God can work in the darkness. Uh, God can do things through us and us keeping our eyes focused on Him. Amen. He can do things in this country. He can do things in this world. Uh, we're not going to limit our God. Uh, we are excited about the things that are going to come, the revival that's going to happen. We're excited about the people that are going to get saved. I'm excited about new faces that are going to be in these pews because they accept Christ as their personal Savior in the coming days. Amen. It is a great time to be a believer. Amen. It's a great time to be in the house of God. It's a great time to be able to hear the message of God. God's Word is powerful. Um, my preaching may not be powerful. I know it's not, but the Word of God is powerful. And I trust the Word of God be powerful in our hearts tonight as we uh, take heed to it and let it work in our hearts. Uh, it will change us. It will motivate us. It will encourage us uh, if we'll just take heed to it. So John chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, uh, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must, the wor I must work the works of him that sent me while his day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, It is he. Others said, It is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Uh, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for the grace that we have in you. We thank you for the word of God and how powerful it is. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would magnify your word. We, you would magnify your name. You would magnify your Holy Spirit. And Lord, help us to be uh, led by that spirit to do the will of God. I pray you fill me with the spirit of God that I may preach with boldness. Uh, Father, please may your word not come back void. And may we make decisions in this new year that would honor and glorify you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this uh, passage of scripture here in John chapter 9, uh, we see here it is about a blind man. Uh, really, it's about the God, of, uh, the God of sight and the God of light, but there's a blind man in the story. Uh, this blind man ends up uh, not seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought it was very interesting uh, as I read this passage of scripture that this man did not seek the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not ask to be healed. He did, he did not do anything uh, to try to get, provoke the grace of God upon him. Uh, God actually sought him out, and I just think that's a wonderful story. But we see here uh, that the blindness of this man and the blindness in general uh, shows and, and, and it pictures the blind state of man. How a lost man is blind in his sin, he's blind to the, uh, to the righteousness of God, he's blind to the, uh, the spiritualness of God. Uh, just as a blind man cannot see the natural things uh, as he looks around, I, at growing up in school there were some blind folks in, in our school uh, they can't see things around them. The spiritual man also cannot, or excuse me, the lost man cannot discern spiritual things around him, uh, for they are foolishness to him. We had the opportunity to talk to a, a man yesterday by the name of Henry. I do hope he's tuning in uh, this evening through the internet. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation with Henry, a, a long conversation with Henry, but uh, the, con the conclusion of the matter was he said, well, you believe what you believe. And, and he, saw, he said, my soul winning partner, you believe what you believe. Uh, and, and I believe what I believe, and we all believe different. Uh, he didn't understand the grace of God, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. He didn't understand that I, I don't want me to believe different, and this guy believed different. We all need to believe uh, what God tells us in his word. Uh, by the way, we know that's the two greatest attack that Satan has uh, in this world today. He attacks creation, and he attacks the word of God. Both of them testify that there is a God of he in heaven. 
And that man first said that, uh, I don't uh, believe the word of God. I believe it was written by man. And, uh, of course, he was uh, attacking creation also. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, a spiritual, uh, our lost man cannot see spiritual truths. Uh, we see that a, a blind man, you, you ask, how do I get a blind man uh, to allow him to see uh, the beauty of creation or the beauty of a sunset? How am I uh, to express that to a blind man? I lived in Seattle, Washington for about four years, stationed on an aircraft carrier, and we got to uh, uh, travel that Puget Sound a lot. Uh, if you've never been in that part of the uh, country, I I'm going to say it's some of the most beautiful uh, uh, green uh, because of all the mist and rain. When there's, when there's beautiful days up there, there's probably about 12 of them a year, uh, but they're the most beautiful days that you've ever seen. You, you go on that Puget Sound, there's uh, uh, humpback wells rolling in the Puget Sound. It looks like a commercial off one of those bank commercials. Uh, you see Mount Rainier on that uh, Seattle uh, skyline. It is one of the most breathtaking, beautiful sceneries that you could a ever see. But how could I get a blind man to see that? How could I get him to see a sunset or, or a burning fire? How could I get him to see something that is, is beautiful like that? By telling him, uh, expressing it and explaining to him. And it's the same thing with a lost man. A lost man, you have to explain to him the word of God. Uh, and it reminds me of the verse that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They have to hear the word of God, uh, see their condition as a lost person, come to Christ, make a decision for him. Uh, but it, it parallels the lost condition of man. This man is actually born in his blindness. Now, it's easy for a man that's born uh, in this handicap or in this blindness to adapt. Uh, from a child, he was in that condition. Uh, so he's able to fill around, and it's not like someone who uh, lived a certain time and was struck with blindness. It would be a lot more uh, difficult to cope with something like that. But the parallel to that is the lost man in, in his sin and in, in his blindness. Uh, as he goes along in, in, in his life, he gets comfortable in that blindness. Uh, so comfortable in that blindness, so adapt in that blindness that he doesn't even know that he's blind. Uh, doesn't even know that he's walking in darkness. And we see that all around us today. Uh, but what a wonderful story uh, about a blind man. So we'll notice here uh, in, in this um, first pa passage of Scripture here, or this first verse, and Jesus passed by. And we can just stop there on those five words, Jesus passed by. Uh, as I looked at that, that was one of those uh, shouting times for preachers when, when you just look at that and Jesus passed by uh, and he saw a man. Uh, I just start meditating on that and, and start remembering the time that Jesus passed by me in my life. And I'm thankful that he passed by me in my life, and I'm thankful that he saw a man. I'm thankful that he, he knew me, he saw me, and this is the most amazing thing, thing of all that, that he did see me, and he knew everything about me, and he did, he, didn't, he did not stop. He knew the sinfulness of my heart, he knew the sinfulness of my life, uh, but he still saw me, he saw everything about me, he saw everything about you, he saw everything about this blind man. Uh, every single thing about him. John uh, chapter 2 and verse 23 through 25 signifies this. Uh, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when, he saw, when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and need not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. So that he knew exactly what was in this blind man. He knew the sinful condition of this blind man but yet he saw this man. Uh, when other people would pass by this man, uh, maybe not give him any help, maybe not give him any money, maybe not give him any existence, uh, any alms or anything like that, Jesus took attention to this man. Uh, and I'm thankful for the compassion that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, showed because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God commended his love, and toward, uh, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. And I tell folks often that, uh, did you know that Jesus died for a particular type of people? And they're shocked. Ah, what, what type of people? This, this sounds racist to me. No, he died for sinners, and all of us are sinners. But he saw, him, he saw a man here which was blind from his birth. Uh, so he was born that way. But we see in verse 2 that his disciples asked him, uh, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And I, I think this is kind of a... Uh, an unusual question, uh, just because it kind of uh, shows that they think that maybe this child had sinned before he was born, and, and I really don't hold that belief. I know that we're all born with a sin nature, um, but I, I, just, I just don't see 
uh, children sinning in their, in their, in their mother, mother's womb. So the disciples had asked this, and, and maybe they got that from Psalm 51, uh, where, uh, verse 5, where David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, in the second part, did this parent sin, maybe they got that from Exodus 20, uh, verses 4 and 5, where uh, God, our, God was given Moses the law, and he says, Thou shalt make, not make of thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them, for the Lord thy God, for I am the Lord thy God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity uh, upon the fa- uh, of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Uh, so maybe they, they knew these verses, uh, thought that maybe this uh, child had sinned, or maybe the parents had sinned, uh, but Jesus answered very quickly here. He answered, look at verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. So he said, this man's blindness, this, this sickness that has come unto this man, is for one purpose and one purpose only, that God's work would be made manifest. Now this was discussed probably before the creations of the world, that this man would be born blind, that he would escape the Jews who tried to kill him in the previous chapter, Uh, that he would seek out this blind man and that he would give this man sight. It was was talked about, you you want to talk about a divine appointment that this man had. Jesus said here that the works of God may be manifest. And and this this begins to uh, remind me of the position that we hold as believers uh, in Romans 8, 28, where it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's something that we know no matter what the winds of this world may blow, we know that everything works out for good. And we also know this, that this uh, flesh is corrupting day by day. And it's, it, it is absolute certainty that at some point you're going to get sick in your life. You just mark it down, you're going to get sick. Uh, it's imminent for death to come upon us. It's going to happen. Uh, I don't mean to sound excited about that, uh, but it's the reality. Those things are going to happen to us. But we know when they do happen to us, God is going to work them out for his good, for his honor, for his glory. We may get those things that the works of God may be manifest in us and through us. A testimony of D.A. Slinker being able to witness to nurse, uh, witness to other patients. Uh, Why? Because his Crohn's disease flared up. Testimony of people with cancer going into the hospital and winning their nurse to Christ who would have never heard the gospel any other way. Testimony of people getting in car accidents and being able to witness to people that uh, maybe killed one of their family members and win them to Christ. We know that all things work together for good. God has a purpose for us. Uh, He's to conform us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it may be that we go through trials. No, no, it is that we are going to go through trials at times uh, for that to take place. So take heart, friend. Don't, don't worry about what's going on on the outside of this church. Don't worry about what the politicians are doing. Don't worry about uh, all the nonsense going on in Washington, D.C. and all the other political uh, realms of this world. Forget all that nonsense because you know what this truth is. No matter what happens in that, in that realm, it's not going to change one blessed thing in this church and our responsibility to worship God, to glorify God, to witness for God, to read our Bible, to pray, to, to win the lost. It's not going to change any of it. I don't care how bad it gets, it's not going to change any of that. And we can take heart in that, that the works of God may be manifest. And he goes on to say here in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. That's a truth that we got to get a hold of, friend. He sticks this right here in the middle of this chapter, or in the beginning of this chapter. Uh, the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was a short ministry. He, he, he ministered for about three years on this earth. Uh, he, he did some wonderful things of, of, of healing the blind, uh, the lame, the deaf, uh, raising the dead, feeding, feeding the 5,000, ministering to the poor. Uh, but his ministry was short. And he's saying right here... Uh, I must work this work while it's daytime. Uh, There's coming a time where I'm not going to be able to work. And and as I'm reading this passage of Scripture, this this truth enters my heart that Christ is not always going to be able to work in me and through me. There's coming a day, whether it be from old age, whether it be from me passing on, even though he's eternal, there's going to come a nighttime where I'm not going to be able to work anymore for his honor and his glory. But right now we can. We need to take advantage of that. Um, we're starting back visitation at, at 10 a.m. on Saturday. 
Uh, we haven't been doing it for some four, four or five weeks, uh, and that's been hard. But that's a little glimpse uh, and taste of the nighttime that's coming where we're not going to be able. There's not going to. There's coming a day at Madison about this church where we're not going to be able to have organized soul winning of any type because of things that are coming. That, that's not to say that we're not still going to get the gospel out, uh, but there is coming a nighttime where we're not going to be able to work anymore. Uh, I begin to think uh, coming in uh, Super Conference Week, it, it'll be uh, our eight eighth year here at Madison Baptist Church and, and the time in those eight years I don't have enough fingers and toes to tell you how many people have passed on the glory from our congregation in that time uh, how many people in eight short years that we've seen uh, pass from this life to the next to go on to glory uh, their nighttime has come they can't work for the Lord anymore uh, so we have to take advantage. I know Brother Arthur preached a message uh, here uh, a few years ago about the space of grace that's that's not changed uh, there's, a, there's a chance that God can do more in this dark hour that we're in right now. Uh, more people can get saved uh, right now if we will just do the works of God. If we'll understand our responsibility uh, and go out and knock on some doors. Uh, there are people out there still, I, like I said, I talked to Henry for almost 45 minutes yesterday. Uh, he was receptive to the gospel message. But we have to make some decisions in this new year. Uh, to, to shake off this spirit of, of lowliness, shake off this spirit of, uh, of not doing anything for God's glory uh, and get busy for his honor and glory because the night's coming where we can't work. So let's take advantage of, of the opportunity that he does have for us. Uh, Moses, uh, his sickness, or excuse me, not Moses' sickness, but uh, his uh, verse in Psalm 90, uh, his prayer, excuse me, Moses' prayer in Psalm 90 uh, verse 12, it says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Uh, and then you see the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, uh, instructing us to pray for uh, laborers in the harvest. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest uh, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. I begin to think of that song, uh, the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. I pinned down some of the words to that song. I don't know if they're accurate or not. It was hard to find lyrics to that song, but I think I, I got it pretty close. Uh, the night may be dark, but why fear the darkness? I'm walking with Jesus, the light of the world. Yes, Christ is my guide. He walks by my side. When sorrows abound and darkness surrounds, in him I confide. Uh, the, out, the outlook is dark, but, the, the, but bright is the uplook. I lift my eyes upward. And there is a light. He says, don't despair. Cast on me your care. The forces of night can't stand the light when Jesus is there. So we're going to just go ahead and get busy uh, while it is still day for God's honor and God's glory. So uh, let's move on in the, in the chapter. Uh, verse 6, we see here that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ can use any method that he, he possibly wants to use to heal. And verse 6, when he had uh, thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Uh, and this had, this had to be a sight. This is divine, supernatural, uh, and I don't mean to be uh, disgusting here, but spit, and I, spit leaving the ground, supernatural, hitting the natural, uh, the dust of the ground, the sin-cursed earth, and those two forces are colliding. He then takes that clay and he wipes it all over this man's face. He anoints his eyes. That must have been a sight. Um, and tells him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash and uh, this man, he went and did exactly what Jesus Christ said to do. And uh, a great miracle for this man. Oh, he, he, he could see. Uh, this, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened, this guy. And he's going he's gonna to show that in this chapter where you can't shut him up about it. He becomes a powerful preacher because God had done a miracle for him. God had delivered him something. He, he'd given him his sight. And so he gets himself in a bunch of trouble because uh, of the miracle that he had and because he wants to testify of it. Uh, but, but the point is that Jesus Christ can use anything uh, to heal anybody. Uh, he often uses physicians and medicine, but he doesn't have to. Um, I know one story, I won't read the whole passage of Scripture, but one guy uh, that had an Im impediment of speech and, and he couldn't hear, Jesus Christ stuck fingers in his ear and he spit and he cried out, Eph Ephratha, uh, be opened and then the man the miracle of the man he was able to speak clearly and hear clearly and Jesus said don't go and tell anybody and then he repeated it don't go and tell anybody 
And you couldn't shut that guy up about it. He went and blazed abroad the matter so much that Jesus couldn't move about. He wouldn't be quiet about it because God had done something amazing uh, in his life. But God can uh, choose any way uh, that he possibly wants to heal you, uh, or any method that he wants to use. When he parted the Red Sea, he uses Moses' uh, rod. Uh, when he uh, decided to heal the bites of the, uh, the Jews who had been complaining about him, he had Moses lift up a brass serpent on a pole. He can use whatever he wants to use. He used uh, a little boy's lunch to feed 5,000 people. Uh, God can use anything that he wants. Matter of fact, he often uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And that's found uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, 28. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. I'm thankful that God chooses foolish and weak things to glorify himself. Uh, if not, there's no way we could be in here tonight. Um, God uses the, the base things to confound the wise, the weak things uh, to bring glory to his name because no flesh needs the glory in his presence. All flesh, uh, excuse me, all glory uh, belongs to him. Uh, so we see here, uh, we're going to look now in, in verse 8. Uh, the neighbors, therefore, and they which, and, and pay, note, pay note to the neighbors. I want to make mention of the neighbors because they're a joyous bunch. Uh, the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind said, Is this not he that, uh, that, that said and begged? So they knew this was the beggar. Some said, It is he. Others uh, said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? And this is his first witness. Uh, he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received my sight. And they said unto, the, and they said unto him, Where is he? And he said, I know not. All right, so this is the first witness that he has. And, and, and we know that a witness, especially a witness in the courtroom, uh, what is he expected to say? What is he expected to uh, testify of? The things that he has heard the things that has happened to him, the things that he has seen, the things that he has witnessed, that's what he's supposed to tell. And, and this gives us an insight of how we're supposed to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. If he has given you spiritual sight, if he has saved your soul, you should have a story about that. And, to be a, and I'm talking about in your own words. I'm not talking about written on a piece of paper. I'm talking about in your own words, using your own story. Being able then to use the word of God to then... Uh, show someone how to trust Christ as their personal Savior. It's called witnessing. And it's something every Christian should do because every Christian should have a testimony. Uh, I was uh, lost for 20, 25 years of my life. I grew up in a Catholic home because of my, my grandparents. My parents were divorced when I was two years old. And uh, that caused a whole lot of uh, trouble. Mom couldn't afford to keep the kids. Uh, she was working three jobs to keep the house. So we stayed with Grandma. We called them Meemaw and Peepaw. And uh, we went to Catholic uh, church with them, uh, catechism, all that stuff, got in, in, enthralled in the Catholic faith because of that. Uh, about the age of eight or nine, mama finally got on her feet where she could take custody of us. Age 13, my dad takes my mom to court to get custody of me. My sister stays with my mom. All that time being raised up in a, in a home of, of chaos and confusion and Catholicism and all that stuff. And I ended up going to the, the military uh, about the age of 19 years old. I uh, spent four years on an aircraft carrier, saved up enough time to get out 60 days early. Uh, when I got out, August of 2001, the very next month, uh, they ran planes into buildings in New York City. People began to jump out of those buildings to get away from that fire. God did something in my heart to, to make me think about things that were eternal. He did something in my heart. Uh, I know tears were coming out my eyes to make me think about what was going to happen tomorrow. We started hearing about a second wave. Uh, we started hearing about uh, our infrastructures being attacked. I worked at a chemical refinery at the time in, in Alvin, Texas. And, and one morning a man came to me and he asked me, if you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? I remember getting a lump in my throat and I said, no, sir. He said, at lunchtime, can I show you what the Bible says? I said, that will be fine. And we started doing that study and he showed me, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He asked me to explain that verse to him. And I was so messed up in my mind, so messed up in, in, in the sinful life that I live, I didn't, even, I didn't even understand that verse. 
He said, read it again. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He told me to explain it to him. I couldn't do it. I was getting upset. My pride was kicking in. Uh, he said, would you, would you explain it to me? I said, I can't. He said, read it one more time. And I got frustrated with this guy. I said, look, buddy, I don't mean to be rude to you, but you asked me to do the Bible study. You're supposed to be the Bible scholar teaching me the word of God. Why do you keep asking me to explain this verse when you clearly understand it? And he looked at me, and I, I don't know that I'll forget this soon, but he looked at me and said, would you just please read it one more time? And that frustrated me to no end, and I said, fine. For all have sinned. <gasps> and I saw it. Those four words, and I started naming Catholic priests, Baptist preachers, Pentecostal people. You mean everybody has sinned? Hold, hold on now. If everybody has sinned, then, then what's, tell me the rest of this. What, what ha I understand this now. What, what's the next thing? Well, this was about a six-week period of time where he began to teach me the scriptures. Uh, finally, I realized driving to work one morning that Jesus Christ was the one that could save my soul, set me free, forgive my sins. And after hearing a gospel presentation on the radio one morning, I bowed in tears, asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save my soul, to forgive my sins, and take me to heaven when I die. And I got born again at a red light. It was kind of like Paul the Apostle's testimony. He was on the road to Damascus. I was on the road to the Do Do refinery. There was a light that shone from Paul the Apostle, and I was looking at this red light right above me. Very similar testimonies, I'm telling you. But I know the Lord had spoke to me that morning. I got saved that morning, and some of the evidence was that morning I got to work, I couldn't cuss anymore. I had one of the foulest mouths you've ever heard in your life. Being a sailor, uh, interesting enough, though, we never cussed on those radios at the refinery. We, they never did that, but they, it, anyway, beside the point. Um, God cleaned up my mouth. He began to change things. It's my testimony. It's my story. It's my witness. He, he's provoked me in my heart to go and tell everybody that story. Go tell everybody you can and then use my word to try to convince them to believe on me, to accept me as their personal savior. Our responsibility. This man was doing that. He was giving his witness. Why? Because something miraculous happened in his life. Uh, but he went and told his neighbors. Now, I think these people were uh, part of the neighborhood watch. Uh, the reason I say that, because verse 13, for whatever reason, it says they brought, they brought to the Pharisees him aforetime that was blind. Now, if you know anything about neighborhood watches, and forgive me if you're in an HOA, this is the, what I have experience with. Uh, unfortunately, I, I gave this testimony this morning. I had a dear brother in Christ come to me, um, and he says, um, it's interesting what you said this morning. I said, oh, really? Yeah. He says, I'm actually the president of our HOA in my neighborhood. <laughs> Oops. Uh, but anyway, we were in Texas, and, and uh, we were at one of those HOA houses trying to share the gospel with folks. We had the, the president or the neighborhood watch. She's following our church van around. Anytime we get out to go knock on a door, she's yelling things at us. Uh, she calls the police on us. The police come and, and talk with us, realize we're not doing anything wrong. Uh, ends up being a, a big stink and all this stuff, and it was just uh, very uncomfortable, uh, very uncomfortable, uh, but nonetheless did not want the work of God to prevail. Uh, and then another time, I was uh, here in Madison, this is not too long ago, we were in another one of these neighborhoods, and uh, we knocked on a door, and I'm, it was Brother Petrie, I was with Brother Petrie, and it was his turn to talk at the door, and uh, he knocks on the door, this, this kind man comes out to the door, uh, he's having a great conversation with him, it's going off to a good start. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, kindred spirits. Uh, all of a sudden, kind of fast, this truck pulls up. And as this truck pulls up, uh, the man who Brother Petrie's talk, talking to says, do you know this man? And we said, no, we don't know this man from Adam. And so that's interesting. So I'm, I'm kicking in the second man mode. I'm going to run interference on this guy. I try to say, hey, you know, I think he knows this guy's going to be a, 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 a family friend or a visitor. He's none of that. He comes up with this mad dog look on his face, and he, he, he gets up to us like this. He says, what are y'all doing here? And he does this number right here and shows us his gun. Like, we're impressed with that gun. And he's like, what are y'all doing here? I said, well, we're with Madison Baptist Church. We're this, making sure this man knows Jesus Christ. He says, y'all are not supposed to hear. You need to get in your cars. You need to get off our property. Of course, we were very Christ-like to this man, but we witnessed to this man, and we talked to him try to be very gentle and just aware of the situation. So we get in our car. We had one more visit to make in that neighborhood, and we went and knocked on that door. Um, we get to the end of the neighborhood, and, and I, I felt like I needed to get out and, and go talk to this guy. He's following us all the way through. 
Um, so I did it very carefully. Um, as he's in his car, I, you know, I'm, I'm back here saying, can you roll down your window? Um, so he rolls down his window, and I tell him who I am. I tell him the burden we have and what we're doing. And uh, this guy's whole demeanor changes. His, eye pop out of, his eyes pop out. Uh, I guess he didn't hear me at the door, but he said, I'm from Lindsay Lane Baptist Church. And uh, I, I just, I just, man, uh, I just, we had some Jehovah's Witnesses in here. I said, no, but, but people in here are lost. They don't know Christ the Savior. He says, man, I want everybody in this community to get saved. And I'm thinking to myself, man, if you had the boldness that you had to come flash your gun to us while we're on a doorstep, if you had a little inkling of that boldness, this whole neighborhood would be saved. Uh, they'd at least have a testimony if you would have that kind of boldness. Uh, but anyway, I've, I haven't had good experience with these neighbors who are these neighborhood watches. Uh, and for whatever reason, they, they saw this blind man, and I think it's a good idea that we take him to the Pharisees. What, what, what is that about? And, and, of course, when they take him to the Pharisees, uh, he then starts uh, witnessing to them, start giving the uh, testimony to him. Uh, matter of fact, he goes from a, a, a poor blind beggar to a powerful preacher. Uh, you see in, in, in verse uh, number 15, And again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. Now this is an argument all the way back from chapter 5, uh, chapter 7. Uh, they want to discredit Jesus Christ because he did work on the Sabbath, wanted to stone him for it, uh, not realizing that he is God of the Sabbath, he's God of creation, uh, but they kept bringing up this issue. And others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They said to him, the blind man again, what sayest thou of him that, open, that, that he hath opened thine eyes? And this is what he said, he is a prophet. This man's heart said that this man is from God. He represents God, he speaks for God, and my heart's testifying that he's a prophet. Man, this, is, this man is of God. And, and, it, and it goes on for, uh, for him. It says, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents unto him that had received him. And look at verse 19. And asked, they asked his parents, them saying, is this your son? Now, I have a hard time with this. I have a very hard time with this because these religious leaders of this synagogue knew who the parents were, but they didn't know who their blind, the blind son was. Uh, they didn't help this guy. They didn't give this guy any, any love offerings. They didn't give, give this guy any shelter. They didn't give this guy any prayer. He, he was sitting outside begging, and these church leaders didn't even know his name. They didn't even know that who, who if the parents were, was his son. Uh, they didn't have any clue about this man. Church leaders. Jesus Christ talks about this in the next chapter uh, when he talks about hirelings. Uh, people that are hired for money, they don't care about the people. They care about power, prestige, and a pat on the back. They don't care about the people. Well, you say, where were you going with all this stuff? Well, uh, it, it should be a burden that we all know the, the names of the children in our church so that we can pray for them. We complain about the, the, genera the next generation always leaving us. They graduate high school, and they always go away. Well, some of the folks, we don't know their names and don't pray for them like we should. Now, that's all fine until you get a family like the Brooks family. It becomes very difficult to know their children's name. I tried in the morning service, and I crashed and bombed on giving them those names. So I'm going to do it right now without even looking at the family. <laughs> All right, you have Matthew, you have Zach, you have Emily. You have Catherine, you have Dylan, you have Amanda. Don't help me. Amanda, Holly before Amanda, by the way. Don't mess that up. Holly, Amanda, then you have Seth. Then you have Rachel, Tessa. Don't mess that up now. Then you have Rachel. And then you have Nathan, the Brooks family. We should be praying for the Brooks family. Should, should know the kids. Now, people like Tony Drinkard mess us all up. All right, Tony Drinkard decided to name all six of his boys with the letter C as their first name. Yeah, thanks for doing that, brother. That makes it real easy to remember Cole, Caleb, Carter, Clark, Cade, and Clint. Very difficult. I get it right? And then you have uh, uh, Briley as the little girl. Uh, but we should know the names of the children of our church. These religious leaders didn't uh, think it was that big of a deal. They didn't even know the man who was handicapped, who had the blindness. They had to call his parents and ask them 
and, and we look at verse 21, it says, But by what means now he seeth, we know not, uh, or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. That, that, that statement right there makes me think that this man is still a teenager. All right, they, We don't know the age of the man in this chapter, but in the Jewish tradition, you become a young man at the age of 12. And I just think it's odd that as they're talking to these, these guys, hey, that guy's old enough, let him answer for himself. Um, so I think he may have been a, a more of a younger man. Uh, also, when the disciples asked that question about, hey, this guy that's born, did he sin before he was born, all that? But I, I don't know for sure, but he, he may have been a younger man. Uh, but the point here is, is uh, in verse, in verse um, again, the latter part of verse 21, uh, we know not, he is of age, uh, ask him, he shall speak for himself. Uh, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he, that he, that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. And shame on these parents. Uh, they didn't want to stand for their son in, in the midst of a re religious uh, heretics. Uh, heathen, they tossed him back to the woods because of, of the pride of life and the prestige that they had. They didn't want to, he, they didn't want to stand with uh, their child uh, when they're being uh, talked about by, by these um, religious people. Uh, friend, there may be a time we do have to stand with our children. And, and listen, I've, I've been trying to teach my children from, from a very young age to speak for themselves. I so said, what do you mean by that? When the religious people are arguing with them? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when they're asked the question. I have to do everything in my power, shut my mouth. Uh, wife, don't, let them answer. Let them navigate through their talks uh, to be able to, to put words together and thoughts together to be able to answer for themselves because there's going to come a time where they are going to have to answer for themselves. Not that I'm not going to stand by them, but they're going to have, have to give an answer of the hope that lieth in them with meekness and fear. They need to know how to speak for themselves. But I'm going to tell you this, if they ever get in trouble for sharing the gospel, our religious people or the people of this world uh, ever chastise them or persecute them, and it's coming by the way, it's going to happen, I'm going to stand right next to my children. I'm not tossing them out to the religious people or the people of this world. Come what may, I'm going to stand with my children. Uh, so shame on these parents for tossing their kid to the religious people uh, who had no care for them whatsoever. Um, but verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did uh, confess that he was Christ, uh, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, asked him. Then again called they uh, the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. Now this is where he um, becomes a powerful preacher. Uh, his uh, changed uh, pr um, professed. He's going to now give his change. Um, in, in, in verse 25, he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. All right, this, this blind man who was healed could not pass our ordination council. All right, his theology and doctrine on God, doctrine on the Lord Jesus Christ was not straight right now. Matter of fact, he's not even born again right now. But what he is right now is he, he is able to see where, wherefore he didn't see before. He says, listen, I don't know if this guy's a sinner or not. But what I do know is I was born blind, but listen to me, I can see right now. That's what he did know, and that's what he testified. And I, and I just want to shout it out loud as I can. I was once blind, but now I can see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for the song Amazing Grace. I was lost, uh, and I was blind, but now I see. Praise God for that. Uh, and you can't shut this guy up because he's professing his change um, we see here the reason from this. Turn with me real quick. Keep your hand over here to uh, John chapter 11. We see the reason uh, that the religious cloud, uh, crowd was intent on casting uh, doubt on the Lord Jesus Christ as a sinner, casting doubt on his name. Uh, um, but we see here in, in John chapter 11, verse 45, uh, this is after uh, Lazarus uh, was raised from the dead. Uh, then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. So they had, a, they had an agenda. They didn't want to lose their power from the Romans. 
Uh, they didn't want to lose all their prestige, so they're going to continue to cast doubt on the Lord Jesus Christ, yea, to the point where they even put him to death uh, because they don't want to lose uh, that prestige that they have. Uh, so this man, he, he ends up then uh, professing uh, his courage is professed. Uh, we see in verse 36, he said, um, they said, uh, excuse me, then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? So he's saying, if, if I witness to you again, are you going to be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you going to be his disciples? I've told you once, uh, I'll tell you again to, for you to be his disciples. Verse 28, then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Uh, and we... We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not whence, whence he is. Uh, and that's a marvelous statement for these religious people to say that. Uh, we know Moses are, but we don't know who this Jesus is. Yeah, because they're lost in their blindness. It's the blind leaders of the blind, and they're both going to fall into a ditch. Unless they turn and recognize Jesus Christ for who he is. Uh, and this man, who is not even a believer, just got healed uh, he said, this man answered and said unto him, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and you think of Cornelius in Acts chapter 2, be a worshiper of God and do his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. This is this man's testimony to these religious Jews standing by himself, his parents forsaking him, him sharing the wonderful truths of, of God. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast them out. So because of that courage, he got cast out of their synagogue. His parents are still in good standing with the synagogue. Shame on them. Uh, but he's now cast out of the synagogue, and he's now alone by himself. And the next verse is, is marvelous to me because the Lord and Savior, the creator of the universe, hears that he's cast out of the synagogue and he goes and seeks him out. Look what it says right there in verse 35. Jesus heard that they, ca that, uh, excuse me, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him, he said unto them, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and, is he that, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The God of sight and the God of light. This man got his blindness healed, both physically and spiritually. He got wonderfully and marvelously born again and saved. Matter of fact, this man is in heaven right now. I, I look forward to meeting this, uh, this man that got healed. Uh, this has been one of my favorite chapters. It's been an encouraging chapter uh, to motivate me to continue to be the witness for God that I should be. And, and it should motivate every one of us uh, because this guy, hardly, this guy didn't know any Bible, yet he had the boldness. I remember when I first got saved that God, God had given me the boldness uh, in my family. My family is a mixture of uh, Smith last name. Uh, so most of my dad's side of the family were all Masons. Uh, my grandpa ended up being one of these 32nd degree masons at his funeral. All the little aprons came off. It's supposed to be a secret society. I don't know why they put the aprons on at the funeral because then I knew every one of them that were masons. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they believed in the great lodge in the sky. Uh, they believed contrary to the, to the word of God. Uh, my other side of my family are Catholics believing in baby baptism and sprinkling and works and all that other nonsense. And um, it was around Christmas time after I got saved. And I believe my grandpa was over the family, so I asked him if I could address the family. Uh, we were at my uncle's house, uh, and I thought it was my responsibility to ask him if I could address the family because it was his house. Uh, they both agreed to allow me to stand before the Christmas tree before we opened presents. Man, the whole Smith family was there. My grandma and grandpa had five children. Uh, and I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is I had a bunch of cousins, a bunch of aunts and uncles. I mean, there's probably 60, 70, 80 people uh, in that room of the Smith family. And as I addressed them with this, uh, God gave me the message to witness, to tell them what happened to me. I cried through most of it. Uh, just encouraged them not to trust in the lodge, not to trust in, in, in false religion, but to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, given that boldness 
to be a witness for him. That's our responsibility. Uh, the night is coming when no man can work. Uh, the Lord is still the Lord of the harvest. He still tells us to pray for labors into the harvest. Um, it is amazing how good God is. It's amazing how gracious he is to us. It's, ama it's amazing the tools, the provisions. It's amazing that he gives the Holy Spirit to us to lead us and to guide us and not to give up on us. Uh, how he leads us. How he encourages us. But it takes us making decisions for God's glory. It takes us to make decisions uh, that we're going to do things for him. We're starting, this is the first Wednesday of 2021. And that sounds like, 2021, it just sounds like a lot. 2021, yeah, that sounded real smart, didn't it? A lot. It just sounds like, okay, I'm, anyway, it's, it's time that we get busy. Uh, this pandemic has lulled us to sleep. It has put a damper on us. It has gotten us to say basically, what is the point? No, 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 no. There is a purpose for us to glorify God. There is a purpose to be the witness uh, to everyone that we can everyone that we possibly can reach before it's too late. That is our responsibility. What decision are you going to make in this new year? We're going to be challenged during the super conference. We was challenged last week uh, about having in the relationship with the word of God. Uh, challenged last week about prayer. Challenged last week from passion. Matter of fact, we're challenged all the time about passion, but what decision are we going to make for God's glory? What decision are you going to make tonight for God's glory? Uh, each of us have to make decisions to get closer to him. Uh, but it's going to take us to exercise the free will that God has given us uh, to do just that. Uh, so what decision are you going to make tonight? What decision have you already made? What decision are you going to make public to God? What, what, what is the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart? Are you going to be a better witness? And if you don't know how to witness, are you going to learn to witness? Are you going to show up Saturday morning? Are you going to show up to your bus, bus routes next week? Are you going to read your Bible tomorrow? Are you going to pray tomorrow? Are you going to seek God's face? Or are you going to ask him to give you one person that you can witness to tomorrow? What decision are you going to make? Are you going to ask God, God, in this new year, would you, would you please let me not go to church just to leave church, just to go through the motions and hear the messages and leave? Speak to my heart. Father, shake me, stir me. Help me to make decisions for your honor and glory, not just go through the motions. What decision are you going to make in this new year? Each of us have decisions to make. The Holy Spirit of God will reveal those to you. So I ask you to um, just consider what God would have you to do in this new year, and you be faithful to Him. Uh, we are in the dark hour, but that's all right. We'll continue to glorify Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you, and we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for the, your mercy. We thank you for uh, what you've done in this life of, of this blind man. Uh, they could be a, such a bold witness for you. We thank you that you saved them. And Lord, we uh, ask that you would give us power from on high uh, to be the glorifiers of you, Father, in, in, in all that we do, uh, seen and unseen, Father, that we glorify you in our lives, in our testimonies, uh, the things that we think, the things that we do, uh, Lord, the things that we say, the thoughts that we have. Uh, Lord, may you get the glory in all of it. Please do a work in this church, do a work in our lives, uh, help us to get closer to you. And we just thank you so much for being faithful to us, Father. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.